Hello, and thank you for tuning into the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and joining me this week is journalist Gary Taubes. Gary has been a very controversial figure in the health and nutrition space for a very long time. He's one of the first guys to come out and say, hey, I don't think that eating carbs makes a lot of sense, and I think I have another reason why people are fat and a solution to get you guys out of that. And so he's been sort of this internet figure, and he's written a lot of great books, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat, and his latest, The Case Against Sugar. And so Gary dives in super, super deep. He has a very interesting background, and we get into the weeds here. So it starts a little slow, but, but ramps up, and we get into the, um, his opinion on really what makes people fat and how to lose weight in a lot of different ways he thinks about it. Super, super useful. So if you're somebody who is even interested in what makes people fat, how you stay fat, and how to get rid of fat, this is a really great science on all things fat accumulation. And even if you disagree with them, I think this is an amazing chat. So without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Gary Taubes. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. Gary, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. So you have a very interesting past of those who don't know you, maybe will know of you uh, through your books and your work. So Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat, Good Calories, Bad Calories. Um, but that's not how you started your career. So you went to school when you were trained originally as in physics and engineering. So how, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you make that shift to, to diving into nutrition in the way that you did? Well, for starters, I, I wouldn't have been, I wasn't a, a very good physics or engineering student. So I had advisors suggesting I find a different career path. Um, always wanted to be a journalist, always wanted to be an invest. well, wanted to be an investigative journalist since I read All the President's Men by Woodward and Bernstein. And when I came out of journalism school, the best job I could get was in science journalism. And it turned out that there actually is the demand for investigative science journalists, if you're willing to uh, be critical and skeptical of things that even supposedly very smart people are telling you. So I spent the first decade of my career doing uh, writing about controversial subjects in high energy physics and nuclear physics and biology. And when you're covering a controversy, you're basically... Uh, doing an investigation to try and establish which side of the controversy is right. You tend to keep reporting, keep interviewing people until you come to a conclusion that one side is likely enough to be right that you can back their position. Um, in the late 80s, giving away my age, some of my friends in the physics community said if I was interested in bad science, I should look at the stuff in public health because it's terrible. And they were concerned at the time with this question of whether or not uh, uh, electromagnetic waves from power lines uh, could cause brain cancer, leukemias. Uh, it was based on the science of epidemiology and or the pseudoscience or <clears throat> sort of science of epidemiology. And uh, when I looked into epidemiology, everything I had learned in the previous decade about how to do science right, this sort of relentless skepticism and critical thinking and meticulous, rigorous checking of every possible alternative explanation was considered kind of a luxury that, that epidemiologists couldn't afford to do. It was just too hard to do, so they didn't do it. And I wrote a relatively infamous piece for the journal Science on epidemiology suggesting that it had reached its limits of usefulness uh, as, a, as a methodology of science. And then that slowly led me into, rather than writing about the methodology, writing about the fruits of the methodology, which included our belief that we should eat low-fat diets to avoid heart disease or low-salt diets to avoid high blood pressure. And, 
uh, <clears throat> one thing led to another. The deeper I dug in these subjects, the la less substance there was to it. Um, is a sort of yeah, so, so it sounds like you sort of some stumbled upon it, and it wasn't like some crusade that you wanted to go dive into nutrition. It was more so just by virtue of there being such big holes there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually got into the salt story purely by accident. It just um, I was doing an article about the first Dash study, which was coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine. So Dash's dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And this had been leaked to the journal Science in advance. I didn't know it had been leaked, but my editor suggested I could write it up and get a quick paycheck, which is what I was looking for. And um, <clears throat> so here's a dietary approach that, that reduces blood pressure more than any, or about equal to blood pressure medications. And when I started interviewing people about it, I, one of the very first people I interviewed was a former president of the American Heart Association. And she told me that she couldn't speak about the subject because she would lose her funding. And I was flabbergasted. I mean, this was a diet study being published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Why, what could possibly be involved with this study? And no matter what I did, I couldn't get her to go. I couldn't get her to tell me even off the record, not for attribution, what her issues were with this study. And uh, then I spoke to a researcher who started uh, effectively yelling at me that there was no controversy over salt and high blood pressure. And I was saying, but I'm not calling about salt and high blood pressure. I'm calling about this diet study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And when I got off the phone with this guy, I called my editor at Science and I said, you know, I had the former president of the American Heart Association refuse to speak to me even off the record, because she said she'd lose her funding if she discussed her issues with this study. And then I had a guy yelling at me that there's no controversy over salt and high blood pressure. When I wasn't calling about that, there must be a controversy over whether salt causes high blood pressure that I know nothing about, right? That's reasonable. And so I'm going to spend some, some of my own time looking into it and propose it as a story to science. It turned out the DASH diet didn't restrict sodium at all and still lowered blood pressure significantly. And there was a, a very vitriolic controversy over whether sodium and salt really caused high blood pressure and a large contingent of people arguing that it didn't and that the science was just terrible. And one of my flaws in this business is I tend, my bias is to be with the skeptics. So if somebody's arguing that the science is terrible, that's those that tend to be the people I'm going to believe. Um, anyway, I spent uh, nine months on that article. I interviewed about 85 researchers for a single magazine article. Uh, I printed out a, a stack of papers about a foot high and sent them off to three uh, biostatistician epidemiologists who had I thought were very good but had never been involved in any way in the SALT controversy so I didn't think they had a conflict of interest and I had them peer review the pa independently peer review the papers for me and it turned out that this evidence uh, the, the idea that SALT caused high blood pressure was effectively if you weren't biased to begin with you would say that it was an interesting hypothesis that never panned out okay. And then it turned out that the, the, the leading proponent of the idea that salt caused high blood pressure was also the leading proponent of the idea that we should be eating low-fat diets to reduce our risk of heart disease. Interesting. And yeah, I, I, didn't, spent, I didn't know the connection there. Yeah, he spent, uh, I spent many, many hours on the phone with this guy. And he, this was a, the, the guy who was yelling at me that there was no controversy over salt and high blood pressure. Um, and uh, he's clearly uh, a terrible scientist. Uh, by this time, I was pretty confident that I could tell a good scientist from a bad scientist just by how they talk about the data and the confidence with which they uh, state their beliefs. You know, the first, Richard Feynman said the first principle of science is uh, you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And so when you find it's researchers who are claiming that it's impossible that they're fooling themselves, they clearly are terrible scientists because good scientists are always worried that they miss something. 
and they're, they're the ones who could most likely tell you what they missed, you know. So anyway, this guy was clearly a terrible scientist. And when he told me that he you know, took credit personally, not just for getting Americans on the low salt diet, but the low fat diet, I knew that there was a story in the dietary fat heart disease. What was this guy's name? Uh, Jeremiah Stamler. Okay. The, the joke on me is he's now, he's at... Uh, He's now about 100 years old, still alive, <laughs> still giving lectures, clearly knows something. Uh, you know, the odds of me living to be 100 are minuscule. But um, Stamler is a uh, somewhat diminutive individual, and, and, and they tend to live longer, so for whatever that means. But, uh, yeah. Got it. So then you started tearing into the low-fat heart hypothesis. Yeah, then I, yeah I spent a year working on a piece for the journal Science on that. Uh, interviewed about 140-odd. I say these numbers only because these are, you know, to me, this is what you have to do when you're trying to, uh, well, journalism like science, the, the, the first thing you want to do is make sure you haven't fooled yourself, right? So you keep just whatever you don't know, whatever I don't know is what, I, what, what worries me. And so, yeah, I just keep, talking to people and doing research, trying to somehow demonstrate to myself that I'm, that I'm as foolish as I probably am and screwed up. And eventually you kind of give up on finding someone who could convince you that you're wrong. Um, so these kind of enormous numbers of interviews and an hour on, I mean, a year on a single magazine story that, that paid me for about a month and a half of my life. Um, but that's, what I believed had to be done to get, you know, find the truth. And, um, and it was fun. Those kind of investigations are fun. And, and uh, where did that, did that take you to your first book? Or I, I know that maybe the, the article is the, the precipice of the book, but I mean, what, what was kind of the point, journey I, for that? I wanted to do a book. Um, I knew there was a book in it, but I had come out of um, my second book. My second book was called Bad Science and it was on this fiasco of uh, late 1980s, early 90s called Cold Fusion. And uh, I had come out of that book uh, $40,000 in debt to my father. So I was pretty sure that a book just criticizing nutrition science wouldn't get net me enough of an advance to pay for more than a year of my life. And um, a book, I was pretty confident a book like that would take me two or three years. And by the time I was thinking about this, my father had passed away and there would have been no one to float me if I uh, went into debt. Um, then I uh, moved to New York and uh, had multiple conversations with the New York Times Magazine uh, editor about articles I could do for the magazine. And the one we came up with was what was the cause of the obesity epidemic? And the obesity epidemic, this was 2000 and 2001, was new enough back then that it was interesting and you could localize it in time, uh, coincident with two fundamental changes in our diets. One was the introduction of high fructose corn syrup. So that was one of my hypotheses. And the other, and that was what uh, Michael Pollan and uh, another writer, uh, uh, I'm going to forget his name, he wrote a book called Fatland. Uh, were promoting. And then uh, the other was this sort of embracing of the idea that a low-fat diet is a healthy diet and we should all eat a low-fat diet to lower our risk of heart disease because when you eat a low-fat diet, you replace the fat calories with carbohydrates. And until the 1960s, there was an idea, the belief was a sort of conventional wisdom was that carbs were fattening. And this was an idea that was put in my head by an NIH administrator who said, you know, in 1984, we put the whole country on a low fat diet and we thought if nothing else, they'd get thinner. They actually didn't have the evidence to really believe it would reduce heart disease risk, but they did have confidence would make people thinner because they'd get rid of fat, the densest calories in the diet, and instead they replaced fat with carbohydrates, which we did, and we got fatter. So that was the other possibility, this idea that you 
add carbs to the diet and you think of carbs as hard, healthy diet foods instead of something inherently fattening and you get fatter. And this was kind of the argument that people like Atkins was making all along. And as I was doing my research, I came upon five clinical trials that had been done, but not yet published. So they'd been discussed in conferences so I could talk about them. And these were all clinical trials of the Atkins diet where you compare this you know, low carb, high fat, ketogenic, ad libitum, eat as much as you like diet to a low fat calorie restricted diet of the kind the American Heart Association was telling us all to eat. And in all five clinical trials, not only did people lose weight, more weight on this eat as much as you want, high fat, you know, butter and bacon diet, but their heart disease risk factors improved. So that kind of drove this New York Times Magazine story to suggesting that maybe Atkins was right all along, which was a lead. And that was shockingly controversial, you know, easily the most controversial article the magazine ran in that decade. And it got me a large book advance, as these articles will do. And suddenly I can afford, I thought I could afford to do the book that I had always wanted to do. And not only could I afford it, there might be a sort of positive message as well as a book just criticizing nutrition science isn't going to interest that many people. If you say everything you knew about nutrition and obesity and weight control is wrong, that's interesting. And it interested me, but what made the publishers excited was the idea that there was a message that might be right and that would actually make people so that was the uh, next five years of my life. The joke is the money lasted four years, and I still ended up in debt. So, so um, what, what was the what was the take home message then? I mean, it was a is it something <clears> you were talking about that just go high fat and, and all is good, or where, where did you come down to? Well, f probably further than anyone would have liked. Um, as it turns out. Nutrition, my take on nutrition science and obesity research is that they, these people are clueless about how science has to be done. It's only, I said this in effect in the epilogue, that it's as though they're playing a game, they're dressing up like scientists. Uh, the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman would have called it cargo cult science, where you kind of put together, you, know, you have laboratories and white coats and you publish papers and all this stuff, but the real meat of what science is to really get to the truth of something is just missing. Um, so the, the idea is that all of obesity science is built on this uh, paradigmatic belief that the reason we get fat is we take in more calories than we expend. The energy balance hypothesis. Nowadays, they, you know, since people like me started criticizing this, they decided they have to use fancier language to dress it up more, you know, a better white coat for this idea. So now a uh, recent term I've seen is the energy homeostasis uh, hypothesis. But the gist of it is you get fat because you eat too much. And it completely leaves out, and I documented this, how this was done and when this was done. It completely leaves out the sort of hormonal uh, enzymatic nervous system regulation of fat accumulation. So just like every tissue in our body, every system in our body, our fat tissue is very well regulated. And the regulation of our fat tissue was worked out in pretty good detail back in the 1960s. And it turns out that the hormone insulin uh, drives fat accumulation in, in fat tissue. Um, and so in effect, you secrete insulin in response <clears throat> to the carbohydrates you eat. And then the insulin tells your fat to store whatever fat you've eaten and to tells your lean tissue and organs basically to burn the carbohydrates and not burn fat for fuel. So you can think of insulin as, a, as the primary fuel partitioning hormone, although all the other hormones play a, a role in this. But by primary fuel partitioning, I mean, it determines whether the the different macronutrients are going to be used for fuel and when they're going to be used for fuel, or whether they're going to be stored or used for tissue repair, protein in particular. So you elevate insulin, you store fat and burn carbohydrates. 
And if you have chronically elevated insulin, as you do when you have this condition called insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, then you're in a chronic condition of fat storage. In effect, you're storing fat for too long a period during the day and you're not oxidized, you're not burning enough of the fat for fuel and so you accumulate fat from day to day and week to week and year to year. And it's a sort of hormonal regulatory hypothesis. It is a hormonal regulatory right. hypothesis of obesity and it, since it's not about how much you're eating and exercising, rather the how much you want to eat and how much energy you have to exercise are other effects of this fuel partitioning phenomena. So if you partition too much fuel to storage, you won't have enough energy left to want to exercise, and you're likely to be hungrier because you're going to want to eat to replace that, replete that energy. Right. Uh, and, and so this, so is, this is pretty much the, the same thing you've been talking about now for, what, 12 years, 13 years? Well, yeah, since Good Calories, Bad Calories came out in 1907, 2007, right. <laughs> 12 years ago, yeah. And, and why, do you, why do you think it's been such a challenge to convince people otherwise? Like, what, what are the main arguments that people who just still think that calories in, calories out is the only way to, to go? And, and why? <laughs> it seems to be like this giant clashing in controversy that doesn't seem to be settling down anytime soon. Yeah, again, it's hard for me to fully understand because one of the – when you study the philosophy of science and the history of science and you're studying this concept of paradigm shifts, one of the defining factors of paradigm shifts is when you're in one paradigm, it's virtually impossible to understand the other paradigm. And they, even the way you look at the evidence and the way you look at the, the, the observations so, are so determined by the paradigm in which you're living that you see things different ways. So... But, I can look at a study and a series of results and somebody who disagrees with me who's grown up in this um, energy balance paradigm can look at it and it's as though we're looking at two different things because our perspectives are so different and our contexts are so different and the questions we're trying to answer are so different that we literally see different things in the evidence. We see different things in the studies and that's what we focus on. Um, and it's, it's, uh, you know, so the, the easy way when I look at it, for instance, so the, the really the, all of obesity research and I, people will criticize this and they'll create straw man arguments, but, uh, against this, but it all comes down to this idea that, that there's more energy in than energy out. And even when, uh, researchers discuss the hormonal enzymatic influences on obesity and the nervous system influences on obesity and genetics of obesity. Ultimately, when you look at their papers, they're discussing how genes and hormones and enzymes influence how much we eat and how much we expend. They never look at how these hormones and enzymes influence sort of fat accumulation like how much adipose tissue, how much fat adipose tissue accumulates and how much it expends. Um, so this is this eating too much, taking in more calories than you expend. You know, I, I spend time trying to come up with metaphors for it. So, for instance, if if I told you that people get rich because they take in more money than they spend, you'd say, well, that's insane. I mean, yeah, sure, they take in. That's a, that's those things mean the same thing. It's a tautology. It's meaningless. Like if you went out and hired a financial advisor and said, okay, I've like been struggling for decades. How can I get rich? And he says, well, the key is we're going to make you make more money than you spend. You're going to fire that guy. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, I know that. But how do I get rich? It says nothing about the how. It just says if I'm going to get rich, I have to make more money than I spend. Um, if we were talking about climate change, <clears throat> And he said, you know, assuming the, let's assume the atmosphere is heating up and climate change is real and avoid all the controversy around it, just make that assumption. And we, you know, the international, uh, these huge international groups said, 
put out 1500 page reports on climate change came out with a report that said the atmosphere is heating up because it's taking in more energy than it expends, which it is. And the reason you know it is, is because it's heating up, right? Those two things are saying the same thing in right. two different ways. Um, you know, I'm telling you, I was listening to a podcast the other day where one of the leading a researcher I, I respect immensely was talking about how for diet to work, it has to put people in a caloric deficit. So a caloric deficit means they're uh, expending more energy than they're taking in. And energy is equivalent to mass in an Einsteinian universe. So it basically means they're losing mass, which means they're losing weight. So what this fellow is actually saying, if he's saying that for the diet to work, it has to put people in a caloric deficit is like saying for a diet to work, it has to make people lose weight, which is what we mean by a diet to work. You're just saying the same thing in two different ways. It's a meaningless tautology. All that said, you know, people don't, when they explain that I'm wrong. So I was recently had this fiasco of an appearance on the Joe Rogan experience. And it was three hours of a young, angry young man picking, you know, of the hundreds of thousands of studies in the clinical literature on obesity, finding 30 or 40 that he believed could be used to challenge this hypothesis, but never addressing the guts of the hypothesis. And I can never bring along the conversation, which is this energy balance thing is meaningless. If people are losing weight, they're expending more energy than they take in. That's a given. Right. But the question is why? Another way to look at it is if somebody is losing fat, their fat tissue has to mobilize more fat than it takes in. Technical term is lipolysis has to be greater than lipogenesis. What regulates that? Because it's a different issue. And again, I've had conversations with very established researchers. I was talking to this one guy at Oxford who was arguably, until he retired, he was a leading authority in the world on fat metabolism. And we had spent, I was interviewing him about insulin resistance, which for a story in science, this was back in 2008, 2009. And we had spent about 20 minutes in which he was discussing how insulin regulated fatty acid accumulation and fat tissue and all the different ways it did it. And this is basically basic biochemistry. You could find this in most up-to-date, well, they don't have to be up to date. Most biochemistry textbooks. And then we got to human obesity. And he said, people get fat because they take in more calories than they expend. And I said, well, wait, professor. When we were discussing why fat cells got fat, it was insulin. And insulin inhibiting this enzyme lipoprotein lipase or stimulating lipoprotein lipase and inhibiting hormone sensitive lipase and, you know, stimulating a fatty acid take up by the, and, 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 and this process of esterification and the fat cell, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get to human obesity and it's all about people eating too much. You, you switched mechanisms on me. The fat cells was insulin mediated and the human body was people eat too much. And he literally said to me, you know, I never thought of that. And about three years after that, I was in England for another ill-fated debate. I should learn not to do debates. Um, clearly not very good at them. The, uh, and I stopped off in Oxford to meet with this guy and we spent a couple of hours. He's wonderful. By this time he had retired, but I wanted to get him. I, to consider these arguments, because what I need from my perspective is having a journalist push this stuff is not a very good idea. There are a few other people who think like I do in academia, including a Harvard professor, David Ludwig. So it's not only a journalist thought, but uh, researchers don't like to be think that that journalist might have come in and struck on something they don't. So anyway, I was in Oxford having coffee or tea with this fellow and saying, look, here's what I think would be a fun thing to do. And you could do it uh, with your former 
colleagues, maybe they can do it with their students, which is create a hypothesis of obesity from the fat cells perspective. So you're asking the question, why does a fat cell get fatter? Instead of asking this question, why do humans get fatter? Because the humans just, uh, you know, the, the con compilation of all those fat, fat cells. So what does the fat cell see? And what do the signals impinging on these things that the fat cell sees in its immediate environment, how do those influence whether or not it's going to take up fat or mobilize it, you know, store it or... And he literally said to me, and I, I, and I said, in, in doing this, clearly we, you can leave the eating too much calories in, calories out thing out of the equation unless the fat cell somehow has a way of monitoring energy status, in which case that's part of the input. And he said to me, I can't do that. I can't leave the energy balance thing out. Hmm. I've been thinking about it for 40 years that way. And literally, I just, he said, I, I don't think I can do that. And I left him with papers and my books. And I said, just think about it. Because it would be an interesting exercise, you know, intellectual exercise, create a hypothesis of obesity from the fat cells right. perspective. So in, and, in your opinion here is, it, so obviously you think that, okay, yeah. we're not asking the right question. We're not, we're not asking like what actually causes fat gain or fat loss. And this is where everybody else goes remiss. And your argument is that it's more of a hormonal ban balance in the, the role of insulin. And when you eat carbohydrates, insulin spikes up and regulates more fat into the fat cell and less fat out of the fat cell. Is this correct? Yeah, effectively. Right. Also, when insulin is high, I mean, there are other factors that, um, like one thing I'm constantly downplaying, and I'm going to downplay it in my new book too, is glucagon, which works opposite insulin. Mm -hmm on the fat cells. So glucagon actually stimulates fatty acid mobilization from the fat cells and glucagon goes down when you eat carbs. Your body in effect appears to be trying to control blood sugar because high blood sugar is toxic. Uh, so you consume about 500 calories of carbohydrates in a meal and they're flooding into your bloodstream and your body has to, you know, if you think about it, you've got about a, a healthy person has about a teaspoon worth of glucose in their blood circulating at any point in time. And if that goes up to a teaspoon and a half, that's effectively a diabetes, diabetic condition. And then you eat the equivalent of, you know, 50 teaspoons of glucose for a pasta dinner and your body has to deal with that. So the insulin is, the way it does it is not just stimulates glucose uptake by the cells so they could use it for fuel, but it tells the cells not to burn fat while that's happening. Um, literally this malineal CoA pathway into the mitochondria. So the, the mitochondria, instead of spending time burning fat when they've got to burn up all this glucose, basically pass the fat through and back out into the circulation so it can be stored. So that's what insulin, it's not just telling the fat cells to store fat, it's inhibiting fat burning in the lean tissue. And this is very much a threshold effect, which is one of the fascinating things. When there's few times this has been studied by people capable of doing it, um, this process of fat burning is exquisitely sensitive to insulin. So when insulin goes up just a little bit, which it'll do in response to carbohydrates and in many people and you know in response to the amino acids being converted to glucose you know the amino acids from protein that tells your fat tissue to hold on to fat and it tells your lean tissue to burn the carbohydrates yeah. not fat so, so i think and, I, yeah I, I think a question that i'm interested to hear your perspective on that i think a lot of the calories in calories out camp would propose is well gary if we gave somebody 20,000 calories of olive oil and they drink that in a day, every day, are you saying that they wouldn't get fat? Uh, yeah, and that's a, and the answer is uh, who knows. Um, the, the, what I'll tell you is they couldn't drink 20,000 calories of olive oil because there's uh, feedback there. And again, this is, remember when I told you that people see different things in different studies? Right. So, and part of the process of science, the advances of science come when you go back to studies that have been done and you find 
the alternative way to see it. So the, one of the classic studies doing exactly what you're suggesting was done by Ethan Sims, a University of Vermont researcher who back in the late 60s actually, he wanted to get people to put on to, to increase their weight by 25%. And he started with college students and he tried to get them to overeat so that they'd gain, you know, if they're 100, if they're 200 pounds, you can get them up to 250, although nobody was 200 pounds back then. And he couldn't do it, couldn't get them to do it. So then he moved to a, the, the Vermont State Prison and he did these experiments in the Vermont State Prison. And he the first thing they thought they would do is try to get people fat on an Atkins diet to prove they could. And that's exactly what you're proposing in effect. It's a high fat, low protein diet. And they couldn't do it. They never published the paper. Again, I interviewed all his colleagues on this work. Um, they described, two of his colleagues uh, described the, uh, you know, these prisoners sitting there with the plates of steaks and pork chops in front of them and just refusing to eat anymore. They couldn't do it. But what they found out was that when they overfed the prisoners on carbs, they could get them to eat as much as 10,000 calories a day. And one of the lines in their paper was that they'd then go to bed early, uh, go to bed hungry. So they'd eat as much as 10,000 calories and go to bed hungry. And what's interesting is the researchers at the Times, this is now about early to mid-70s when this dietary anti-fat phobia was coming up. Um, they concluded that if they actually looked at the percentage of weight gain per excess calories consumed, people would store more calories from fat than carbs. So what they found out is the most they could get people to overeat fat in any one day was about 800 calories. It was like a stick of butter extra. And if they ate that stick of butter, they would they would store a greater proportion of that 800 calories than they would if they were eating 7,000 extra calories of carbohydrates. And then they wrote this up as supporting the idea that dietary fat is particularly fattening. But what they didn't address is why is it they could eat 7,000 calories extra of carbs and go to bed hungry, and they described this process of eating 800 calories extra of fat as heroic. So, and, so your argument is just that the more fat you eat and the less carbohydrates, your innate satiation will, will kick in and you won't overeat? Well, satiation is responding to this fuel partitioning phenomenon, what's happening in the periphery. But yeah, so if your body remains well fed, which will happen if you keep insulin down and consume, if then, and this is probably particularly your liver, this is a hypothesis I've always been fond of and I never even managed to work into any of my books because it's another level of too much complexity for for these books that ideally lay people could read um, but as long as insulin remains low your liver and your lean tissue is feeding on fat and it's perfectly happy doing that so there are no sort of um, you're you're not hungry and at some point, you're clearly satiated. If you just imagine the, the example I used in good calories, bad calories, I said, imagine eating uh, the equivalent calories of a medium-sized bag of popcorn as cheese while you're at the movie theater. Right. <laughs> okay, so it's like instead of 1,000 calories of popcorn or 600 calories of popcorn, I want you to eat 600 calories of cheese. You can pick your cheese, but it can't have sugar in it or any other carbs. I'm not even going to let you have crackers because the crackers will stimulate insulin secretion. You want to keep insulin low. And most people can't do that. And I think most people would even get a little nauseous thinking about it. Right. Because on some level, your body is trying to prevent this kind of overeating you if see. it doesn't need the calories. So Whereas with carbs you can do it effortlessly just once you get started um the uh you know you just keep going so i can do it effortlessly yeah very very interesting so one of my points of view on this has been sort of that and i'm, and I'm sure you'll, you'll you'll be able to correct me if i have any false steps here but that you know it's not all that the good the calories in calories out makes sense i think that mostly 
your argument makes the most amount of sense that there's a lot of variables in the human body. And I think that hormonally speaking, that that's most of what's going on here. But looking back the other way, it's in, I'm sure you can point to a lot of different studies here, but from what I've seen, any amount of food, any amount of anything, it's like, it's not like you consume a massive amount of fat and we don't have any secretion of insulin. So even if we were to say people could drink 20,000 calories of olive oil, you can still point to some area under the curve that that puts you over this fat threshold or it's a, this this storage of fat threshold of insulin being spiked. Um, and I mean, and then you look at, I think that a lot of people, because I mean, we deal with a lot of people in the ketogenic space right now where they're making very artificially hyper palatable meals that I think that, yes, if somebody's just eating real steak, you know, steak in, in, in some butter on it and things like that, or just cheese, I think it'd be hard to overeat. But so many times people are putting different seasonings on it, combining with different things, over salting them or, or doing a lot of other things to make them very, very tasty in which they consume way more and thus consuming well, way it, more, they're going to have a higher spike in, in insulin just because any food is going to increase insulin to some degree. Um, yeah. Well, except fatness, does fat increase? And in, although ketones will stimulate some insulin, no yeah. ketones. Yeah, they will. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, these are interesting questions, and I would. In an ideal world, we could, we would have an unlimited supply of like humans who would do exactly what we told them to do, and then you could test all these things, um, and actually see experimentally what happens. So a lot of this is speculation. I the the hyper palatable or whatever you want to call it, these food like these keto food like substances make me nervous. Because I find I crave them. So there might be another phenomenon going on if, you know, I know they're in the house. I love good good fat bars from this Canadian company, Susie's Good Fats. And But if they're in the house, I'm thinking about them all day long. So if I, if I get a box in the mail, I'm going to eat them in three days. I'm going to justify binge eating them just so I can get them in the house, out of the house and stop <laughs> um, eating them. But even then, this, and this is where the calories thing um you know, it's interesting. You have to take all these. It's just, you have to change how you think about these things to sort of see. You know, I think again, this uh, one person who's been tweeting at me regularly about what an idiot I am is Elaine Norton, uh, this uh, PhD exercise trainer guy in Florida. And uh, so the, somebody will do a study. And for instance, I'll have somebody email me, someone who lost 300 pounds on a you know, low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. And I'll send it out there and say, this is you know, my daily dose of confirmation bias. And I love to see it because I'm acknowledging that this is indeed, you know, people don't tweet at me when they, they, well, sometimes they do. So let's say, you know, and then Norton will, will tweet somebody who lost 40 pounds or even a hundred pounds, but kept some sugar in their diet and restricted calories. So that's evidence that this is caused by calorie restriction to him. And so I think, well, here's the interesting experiment. We can do this with that person. So let's say you know, the latest I saw was some 28-year-old kid. He uh, lost 40 pounds, went from about 3,500 calories a day to 2,000, but also kept some sugar in his diet, 40 grams of sugar a day, which is about a Coke and a half. It's very modest for most 28 year olds, I would think. Um, so now he's trying to maintain his weight loss at 2000 calories a day on this mixed macronutrient composition. Let's transition him to a ketogenic diet and see how many calories he has to eat to maintain his weight loss. Would it go up? Would it go down? Would it stay the same? The calories, if you're going to talk about calories, you're assuming that the relevant factor in maintaining weight loss is the calories as opposed to the, the, the effect of the macronutrients on hormones. So I would bet that we could take that same kid, transition him to a ketogenic It's a shame this kid didn't have an identical twin because then we could have put the identical twin on a ketogenic diet. And I bet he could have kept eating 3000 calories a day. Most People, especially those of us who work out when we're young, could do that effortlessly. I probably could have eaten 5,000 calories a day of a ketogenic diet effortlessly. I might have been force feeding myself a little, but when I was working out two, three hours a day, I might have come easy. So, would you have seen the same weight loss with, say, 500 more calories a day or 1,000 more calories a day? And if you did, 
I don't know if you would, maybe I'm wrong, but if you did, then that tells you what the problem with thinking in terms of calories. Right. So, Why I find that such a bankrupt way to think about it, because the calories might change dramatically depending on the macronutrient composition. So I think that that highlights a point where, again, I subscribe to, I think that they're all variables that can be controlled. And <laughs> when you go to a ketogenic diet, they've actually, do you have some studies on this? I'm sure you've seen them. I don't have them off the top of my head that show um, isochloric diets between ketogenic diet and non-ketogenic diet. You can eat way more and either lose weight or stay at the same weight. They've, I mean, I've seen several papers that, sh that have demonstrated that. Um, but I mean, from, from what I can tell, it seems to me like the, the, the calorie, the amount in, and I would love for you to poke some holes in this, but is, is still an, is still a, a factor that can play in fat loss. Uh, oh, it's, it's, however, it's, however, it's, it's, it's one of the many, many variables, but I think that hormonal regulation is probably tip of the iceberg and what we want to look at first, uh, you know, well, let's, gut let's, health, yeah. genes, all these other things I think play a lot, but, but so do I think calories to, to some small degree. I don't think that it's only you measure in 500 calories versus or 750 or whatever you want to do. It's like it, measuring just the deficit of calories is not going to be the whole picture. Let's, let's go back to the climate change analogy. Okay. So you know, what's happening, again, we're going to assume that the, the, the scientific community, the consensus is right, just for discussion. Um, I suspect they are in that case. Um, the, uh, the reason the, kind of the atmosphere is heating up in this, this, with this assumption is because energy is being trapped in a particular layer of the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. So the amount coming in and the amount of the amount of energy entering the atmosphere hasn't changed. The amount of energy leaving the atmosphere has decreased because some of that energy is being trapped by greenhouse gases. So knowing the amount of energy coming in and knowing the amount of energy reflecting you know, various uh, you know, surfaces and being trapped in, in soil and in, in, in plants and in trees and in rainforests and all that is vitally important to understanding this. But fundamentally, what we've got is an energy trapping problem. And in order to solve it, you have to understand the energy trapping and then you have to understand how, what you're going to do about it. But the step number one is what's trapping energy in what layer of the atmosphere? Uh, what's the source of those particles, those gases? Where do they come from? So if you just had an energy balance model of climate change, you wouldn't learn anything. Right. Okay, that's it. It's just period. All you could say is more energy is coming in than leaving, which we know by definition, and you make zero progress. And you're throwing away trillions of dollars in research money. Then once you start thinking of it as an energy trapping issue, so again, knowing how much energy in different wavelengths is coming in and being trapped by these particles and that particle is vitally important. So how much energy, knowing that is vitally important, but what you're looking at trying to understand is the energy trapping issue. And once you've solved that, once you understood that, you can begin to solve the problem and, you know, make progress. And so, again, ultimately what I'm arguing is just a fat trapping problem. Got it. But I mean, Tiny I think that... bits of fat are being trapped just like, you know, it's actually, I hope I'm right about this. I'm going to have to double check, but it's a, it's a tenth of a percent. Every fat cell increases... Well, fat cells increase on average their fat storage. If they increase by a tenth of a percent per day, that's about two pounds of fat stored on a typical human per year. Got it. Okay, it, so it's a tiny number. And that number is going to be primarily, in order to understand it, you've got to understand the hormonal enzymatic regulation of the fat cells and how many calories of different macronutrients we consume will play a role. And some people and I know this for a fact because they, I believe them when they tell me, cannot lose weight even on a ketogenic diet without, cannot get below a certain level without restrict, consciously restricting how much they eat. And so what, and it, yeah, what is your thought on, on those people? Um, I think that they're doing the best they can and that, 
you know, it's in effect, uh, if you imagine we have a system that's been dysregulated, not only by our own diets and our lifestyles, but by that of our mothers, particularly, and her mothers, you know, because we're programmed on some level, our how much, you know, the, our not just our genes, it's all the epigenetic factors that we come out of that, that are sort of programmed in in the womb by our mother's diets and their uh, metabolic health when they're pregnant. Um, and some people, you know, I, I, it's a woman I've been talking to recently in Texas who uh, was 280 when she started a ketogenic diet and lost 70 pounds pretty easily and did so without hunger, which is sort of a key to this phenomenon. You can tell people to eat ad libitum. And then the weight loss slowed and stopped. And we've been this, you know, I just think she's in her late 40s. There's a lot of other hormones that are influencing fat accumulation, particularly sex hormones. <clears throat> and I think this is the best she can do. It's conceivable that if she starved herself, she might get down to 140. So starved herself on a ketogenic diet. But I don't think she'd be able to sustain it. And I think eventually her body would sort of blow up on her, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, if I think about my own situation, uh, okay, so right now I'm 6'2", about 2'10", 2 215, something like that. I've been up as high as 240. I played football at 240 in college, 238. Could never get to 240 then. Um, I ate a terrible diet. I mean, I ate a sort of healthy American diet for the first 30 years of my life. And then with the low fat dogma, I transitioned into a low fat, relatively high sugar diet because I thought things like uh, fruit smoothies and, uh, you know, fruit juices and Arizona iced teas were health foods. Um, and that's when I slowly. So I went from football to 40. I got down to 210. I stayed at 210 for a decade, and then I slowly started gaining two pounds a year. And then eventually, I went on a ketogenic diet and got back down to 210. And you know, there's some oscillation. But I think if I had never, if you just took my genes and put them in a hunter-gatherer environment, I'd probably be instead of 6'2", 210, I'd probably never have been over 5'11 and 180. Right? If I had never seen refined grains and sugars. Even I maybe even 160. I bet I'd be that light and probably a few inches shorter as well. Maybe multi, you know half a dozen inches shorter. If I had started on a ketogenic diet at 18 when I was in high school, and in high school the heaviest I can get in football is 195. I bet I'd have gone down to about 180 and maybe never gotten over 180. But then after a lifetime of this first, the low fat nonsense and the sugar consumption and an extra 20 years of sort of driving fat accumulation and then insulin resistance at this point, you know, even if I starved myself, I doubt I could get below about 195. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a really great point that you make is that obviously we have genes, but the, everyone has their own individual human history. I used to be super overweight right. when I was younger as well. And I think that I gain weight faster than most people. Um, and that's just, like you said, there's a lot of other fractures that go into that, but it, looking but, at where people are now on an aggregate and say, just in the Western society, I mean, what do you think is the easiest way to move forward here and be able to take your advice from what you put in your books and start reversing some of this stuff? Is it, is it a ketogenic diet? Is it only whole foods? I mean, what is your sort of takeaway that, X, Y, or Z thing in nutrition would fix a lot of the problems that we have, given the state yes. where that. So if we were all, for those people who are lean and healthy, they know who they are. Um, you know, a whole food diet's probably fine. They, and a whole food, by the way, as soon as you say whole food, you mean no sugar, because there's nothing right. whole about sugar. So you're eating a whole food, real food diet and cutting back on sugar. Those people are probably going to do fine. But the rest of us, you, you said, you know, you, you fatten quickly. The phrase I bring back in my next book from the diet book doctors of the 60s is fatten easily. Some of us fatten easily. Like we know who we are. We don't have to get genetic tests. I mean, I knew I fattened easily, easier than my brother when I was eight years old. Which is, a, which is a giant argument against why calories are not the only thing that matters. I mean, it's just a very simple fact. Everyone knows these people, and you're either one of them or you're not. 
We don't yeah, know. well, that's and it's exactly the argument. It's sort of if you just ask the question, why do people fatten easily? It's not about how much you eat, because the point is, you know, we all know people who can eat a lot and don't fatten easily. <laughs> why do we fat easily? Eat fat easily even when we don't eat a lot. It's just, why do we find these? What regulates that? So don't ask me what regulates appetite and hunger and satiety or even energy expenditure. What regulates this fattening easily thing? So for those of us, and the, the more the, the heavier we are, the more predisposed, you know, I think of it as a sort of spectrum from health through metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance to obesity and diabetes and all the chronic diseases that associate with it. So the more metabolically disturbed you are, the more likely you're going to need something that looks a heck of a lot like a ketogenic diet to be as healthy as you can be. And anything else is going to be problematic. I think anything else eventually is very likely to fail. And then the question is, how likely is a ketogenic, if, if you're going to, so remember I talked about this insulin threshold, that tissue is exquisitely sensitive to insulin. Um, above a certain threshold, you're storing fat and you're burning carbs and below that threshold, you're mobilizing fat. It's like a switch. If you actually look at the, the, the journal articles discussing this, it, it looks like a switch in the data. Um, it's that abrupt. And the researchers who study it talk about it. And if you're below that threshold, you're effectively, you're mobilizing a lot of fat. You've got virtually no carbs in your diet. Whether or not you're measurably in ketosis, you're eating a ketogenic diet. And for many people, I think you have to be below that threshold to maximize your health. You know, can they lose a little weight or lose some weight? I think there are a lot of people who are you know, still metabolically healthy enough that they can get rid of the, the worst offenders or sugars and refined grains and maybe, you know, really easily digestible carbs, depending what you think of potatoes and, you know, be very healthy and be relatively lean. And maybe, you know, I, I get that eating carbs enhances physical performance, although so do a lot of substances that aren't in the long term good for us. So, you know, that's where the personal thing is. But I think for a large percentage of the population, if, and this is the argument I'm making in this new book, if they really want to be healthy, um, then it's a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet. Right. And then as far as, obviously you've made the, the case against sugar uh, in the title of a book, but for the last 12, 13 years, uh, have you dug into vegetable oils at all and their role? I, I've spoken to a few different people here about how they can change a lot of the hormones as well. Um, any deep dives there on the horizon or that you've done? Um, you know, I know I have researchers and friends who are who think vegetable oils are worse than refined grains and sugars. Um, it's conceivable that when you go on a like an Atkins diet or a ketogenic diet and you target carbs, you're targeting processed foods, you're getting rid of the processed foods, so you get rid of the vegetable oils as well, and that's why the diets work so well. Or it's conceivable there are people out there who can just get rid of you know, polyunsaturated fats or omega-6 fatty acids and get healthy and continue to eat white bread and drink Coca-Cola. Um, I haven't seen these people. Right. And I just don't find it. It could be true. It's like I didn't focus my research on that because I'm also thinking if you get rid of the sugar and refined grains, you're getting rid of the processed foods, so you're getting rid of most of the crap oils with it. Um, they all tend to go together in Th that's actually know, not what we've food seen. Like yeah, I've seen a lot of people in a ketogenic diet switch and make some progress that like you're seeing, but then hit hit sort of a wall with some fat loss and how they're feeling subjectively. And again, this is just anecdotally, but then when they're cons looking at their diet, they're consuming massive amounts of vegetable oil in sauces, in marinades, and what they're cooking their food with, dressings, everything. Although those marinades often come with sugar. And the f so it's just, it's, it could be true. I, yeah. I, I haven't seen, I tend to believe what people tell me. My default is if somebody tells me they did X, yeah, it's funny, my birthday was a week ago, one of my oldest friends called me on my birthday. She's got a grown son and daughter, and she said her son recently lost 40 pounds on a vegetarian diet. And fascinating. Thank you for telling me that on my birthday, Susan. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to believe it. I mean, it's interesting because her son was also tall and thin. So as I asked her, like, where did the 40 pounds come from? Your son, son was, but what else did he give up when he gave up the, when he switched to vegetarian? Was it only meat? Right. You know, and then there are questions, uh, or was it the, uh, typically when people come they, 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 you know, even the vegetarians and the vegans will talk about a healthy vegetarian vegan diet, which is the one that works is the one that doesn't have sugar and white bread in it. Um, it does have vegetable oil. So, so it's just, it's one of these questions where, you know, I, I'm fa- it's possible. I, anything is certainly possible. And there's enough people who believe it that I think that they must be getting, you know, their, their ideas reinforced from anecdotal evidence the same way I am. Their own confirmation bias is coming in. I just never found the, um, the data that compelling. I, the way I thought about it is if we had populations like if I had two populations that didn't eat sugar and white flour, and now I could ask the question, what's the vegetable oils doing to them? You know, the signal to me from the, the carbs and the insulin-related signal is so big that you have to get rid of it so you could see the smaller, the, what to me has to be a smaller signal from vegetable oils, but I could be wrong. It's the kind of thing that you could study, though. It'd be relatively easy to study because right. if you're doing a clinical trial, you only have to replace. You're not repla- If you're trying to do a low carb study, for instance, you have to ask what do you replace the carbs calories with. If you're testing the hypothesis that particular types of vegetable oils are bad for you, you can swap the vegetable oils out and replace them with you know, animal fats, butter or lard, or replace them with vegetable oils that are, you know, omega-6s get replaced by omega-3s, and that way you can fix the calories. You still can't do long-term studies, but you could at least do short-term studies. It should be amenable to experimental tests, and then I, when I look at the tests that have been done, I don't find them very compelling. You know, the signals are small. There's a lot of noise. Um, Doesn't mean I'm not wrong. I just haven't been convinced by that belief system. Right. Well, there's always work to do, so I'm sure keep you busy. Keep you busy for a long time. Um, Gary, thanks for being on the show. Where can people find everything that you're into right now? Uh, You know, my website, GaryTalbs.com, although I don't keep it up. Uh, I'm hoping I will. And then I have a just finished a new book that I hope will be out by uh, early winter next year, fingers crossed. And at the moment, uh, the title is How to Think About How to Eat. And it's a uh, weight control, healthy body manifesto. So again, trying to get people to understand these ideas and kind of take control of their bodies by thinking in terms of you know, sort of hormonal enzymatic, like when they're getting fat or not, you know, doing the math about why they're getting fat or figure out the hormones involved with their fat issues and address those. Um, so we'll see. All right. Well, thanks, Gary. Thank you, Anthony. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast and leave us a review. And if you need a keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks and we'll see you next time.